Well, one of the most outstanding spring flowering plants Sylvia has in bloom right now is the clematis. The clematis is a hardy flowering vine that will certainly grow well in Oklahoma if you respect its needs. It must have its roots in a shaded place so they'll st stay cool, but it likes to have the foliage up in full sun. And this one is up on a trellis, getting as much light as possible. It'll get quite a bit of afternoon sun. There are two varieties here. This one is called Ramona, and it starts off a little bit deeper purple and then fades to a lighter lilac color. And then this is Red Cardinal, and they're a nice color combination. Sylvie has some small, hardy sweet peas growing up through them for a mix later this summer. Now over here in full sun, are some hardy dianthus. And if you've ever received carnations in a flower arrangement, this is um, from the same group of plants. In fact, they smell like carnations, a nice, sweet, spicy smell. But these are very hardy. Some people call them cottage pinks. And when the flowers have gone by, you still have nice silvery green foliage. They give you an outstanding show in the spring and continue with that nice foliage all summer long. Now here are some hardy flocks that have already gone by. We have a few over here that have just finished flowering. There's a tiny red flower left on this one. But next to it, the alyssum is in full bloom. And alyssum is considered an annual here in Oklahoma, but it will self-sow. And Sylvia's white and also her purple alyssum has self-sown and just spread out into the garden. It smells very sweet right now and will continue blooming on through the summer if you give them good care. Now, Sylvia tells me that there's a tiny black insect that will eat the blossoms back, and some people think they've just gotten burned out in the sun. But she said some malathion insecticide seems to take care of that, and she has blooms all summer long. Over here are some miniature roses, and at one time she had, tells me she had 200 varieties of these in her yard, that they're very easy care, now with these, uh, you can still get black spot, like with regular hybrid teas or floribunda roses, but they fit in nicely in a perennial garden because you can have many, many types within a small area. Well, Sylvia's back there potting up some hardy ferns, and I want to show you where she has hers growing in her yard so that they give her nice green, ferny growth all summer long. I think most every garden needs an arbor just like this one. Sylvia and her husband built it with just two by fours and some lattice work tacked on the outside. I'm sure you could do something similar in your own yard. And it's a nice gateway from one section of the yard to another one. Now on here, Sylvia is training Henri variety clematis, and it's going to grow up and blend in with this blaze rambler rose. And the effect will be really nice. And she tells me that's a typical English effect in gardens, to mix the two. Now over here is a perennial you may not be familiar with, this is called coral bells or heuchera, and in a few days, these pink buds will open and they'll hang down like little tiny bells. It should be really attractive. In front of it is a perennial that will take over in your garden if you let it, but it has a nice soft texture and will cover a multitude of sins in the garden. It only gets about 8 to 12 inches high, and it's called rabbit ears or euphorbia. It's blooming right now and very readily self-sows. Over here is some sedum, and you're probably very familiar with that as a ground cover, but have you ever seen it growing in a teepee planter pole like this? Now, you see planter poles like this a lot at gardening shows where they've planted with impatiens or begonias or strawberries. And Sylvia has planted the sedum in here, and it's pretty much self-care. In the center is a pipe where she could run water down the center, and there are holes along there and it makes a nice vertical effect in the garden. But further on over here, she has some columbine, or aquilegia, and columbine is the state flower of Colorado, but it'll grow just fine here in Oklahoma with some care. Now these are on the north side of her house, and as the sun moves further south this summer, these will get shade in the afternoon, or, or shade all day almost, and stay in nice cool soil, and that's the trick to getting columbine to grow. Sylvia tells me in England these are called Granny's Bonnets, and they do look like little bonnets hanging down. There are several colors of columbine that you can grow in your own garden. Remember, it is a perennial. It'll come back year after year. Here's some more of the cottage pinks or dianthus, and they're growing out nicely over the brick, as are the flocks right here. Now, over here 
is uh, a plant that's a member of the daisy family called pyrethrum. And there are two colors of it. This is a light pink, and in front of me is a, a pure white. And they're related to the pyrethrum that we use as a pesticide, although this is a different species, but it makes a nice perennial. And she has these at the west end of this bed, where they're going to get full afternoon sun. When you're planting a perennial bed of any kind or a perennial border, you need to think about where the sun's going to be all day long. She wouldn't want to have clematis or columbine up here because in the afternoon it would get too hot. But these would be very happy here. Over in here is a little bit more columbine, slightly different color. And then back here are the bracken ferns that she's been growing. And they will very readily send up new plants from underground runners. And just like with the columbine, they'll stay in full shade all summer and stay nice and cool. In front is another form of sedum. There's a variety of this called Autumn Joy that in the fall produces a nice flat bronze head that can dry very readily. Again, this helps keep weeds down, grows in sun or shade. In front of it is a hosta plant. And we've looked at hostas from time to time on Oklahoma Gardening, but we've never mentioned some of the problems they can have. Now this large blue form right here is fairly tough leaf, and so not very many pests bother it. But up ahead of it is a much more tender form right here, and it has hol holes chewed in it. You may at first look at that and suspect caterpillars, but the damage is caused by slugs. And the more tender foliaged types of hosta are prone to slug damage. One thing that attracts them is if you have a very heavy mulch right next to hostas. Hostas do need to be kept in the shade and the cool moist conditions attract slugs in and of itself, but do try to keep mulch away from them. There are some pesticides that you can put down such as slug baits, but if you have pests, pets around or birds, uh, you may not want to put that down. An alternative is to use diatomaceous earth. Now last week on our show, we talked about some pest controls, and I mentioned diatomaceous earth. Let me expand on what that is. Diatomaceous earth is mined in coastal areas, and it is the fossilized remains of diatoms, which are tiny organisms that live in the ocean, and deposits of them as they die and have fallen to the bottom of oceans eons ago are found in coastal areas, and those are harvested and the, the earth itself is a white powder. You want to be careful with it. It's almost pure silica, and if you looked at it under a microscope, those particles are very, very spiny. And that's how it works on slugs and other soft-bodied pests. You scatter it around on the, the foliage and around the soil, and it will pierce their bodies and, and cause problems in that way. But you need to use caution with diatomaceous earth. Don't rub your eyes and don't breathe it breathe the dust as you're applying it because it is also irritating to the soft body tissues in our bodies. Well, on over here, Sylvia has some lamb's ear. And uh, we've looked at this before, but I'd like to remind you again that it's an excellent perennial in the garden. Some people call it the colonial band-aid plant because in colonial times, our forefathers would harvest these leaves and put them on cuts, tie them on with a string, and it had a very soft cushioning effect. And that too grows in sun or shade. Let's go on after the sunny part of Sylvia's yard and look at some islands of flowers that she has planted. Your flower beds don't have to be tied right next to the house or along the edge or perimeters of the yard. You can make islands out in the center of your yard. And this works best if you do not have a Bermuda grass lawn because that would invade the beds, or you'll have to keep it fought back with herbicide or a lot of digging. But Sylvia has a ryegrass lawn, so it works out well. She shorted up around the edges with bricks, and this one has a nice effect because it has dragon's blood sedum creeping along and filling in. In the center, on either end, are roses, and then in, in the very middle is a red leaf Japanese maple. Then in little clumps every so often, she has pachysandra. And if you're doing a little bed like this, keep it simple and try to have it have a fairly open effect and keep it as low maintenance as possible. And over here is another island that Sylvia's put in in the lawn. 
and it is ringed around the edges with creeping flocks that have gone by that give her nice green color all summer, another Japanese maple, and then some miniature roses on either side, and some rocks that she has selected to fill in around some daffodil bulbs that have already gone by. Ribbon grass like this gives nice contrast, a nice clumpy effect on the edge of this larger island. And this one is in transition right now. She used to have it in roses. A lot of them had winter kill. And you've probably experienced that with your roses this year too. So she's transformed it over into a dogwood patch. In the centers here, she has red twig dogwood. And that's a different species than our regular Cornus florida, or flowering dogwood. The red twig, twig dogwood has special interest in the wintertime. The twigs are bright scarlet, very, very attractive. And then the regular Cornus florida, or flowering dogwood, will fill in here, give her shade, and have a very different effect than when the roses were here. For some color right now, here's some Johnny Jump Ups, or violas, very, very sweet looking. They're related to pansies, but a much smaller flower, and these are perennial come back every year. Then back in there in the hot pink is Sweet William, and there's some other varieties of that in place all around Sylvie's yard, and it will grow in sun or shade. Now let me show you what she's done to soften the effect of a board fence. If you have a board fence like this one on your property, you might want to soften the effect of it by planting wisteria and letting it cascade down over the top. Now you do have to be careful with wisteria because it can break down weak structures, but uh, with proper pruning and all, it shouldn't be any problem. Along here, Sylvia has in the backdrop planted flocks, and these are the hardy flocks that get quite tall. In the more shaded areas towards the back, she's kept them pruned so they'll branch out and they'll have more flowers and be stouter and they won't fall over quite so badly. In the foreground, she has some iris and lilies, and then down here, bishop's weed. And that's a ground cover that we mentioned a couple weeks ago on Oklahoma Gardening. And it's a nice blend, especially with these white peonies right here. Now remember, one thing about perennials is that they are easy to grow. They'll quickly get very large and fill in large areas of your garden. And the best thing about them is that when you divide them, you can share them with your friends. So try planting some this season. We hope you've enjoyed this classic from the Oklahoma Gardening Vault. Remember, even though these tips and techniques are timeless, there's always something new to learn in the world of gardening. By subscribing to both Oklahoma Gardening and OK Gardening Classics, you'll have access to a wealth of gardening knowledge, both classic and contemporary.